First of all, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, short bite-sized learning and education series on TMTV. Today, we're joined by Dr. Tim Farewell from Terra Firma, um, and we're going to be looking at climate change and notably the impact of subsidence or subsidence on property transactions. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, Dr. Tim is a um, one of the UK's uh, leading academics on ground hazards. Um, he specializes on geo hazards and the impact of those geo hazards on property uh, overall. And obviously we're all fully aware climate change exists in the air and we'll talk about pollution and everything else, but the ground is very, very heavily impacted by climate change as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tim, who's going to run through a, a brief presentation of about 15 to 20 minutes. If you do have questions, please, feel free to enter them in the chat box, as Hannah has just mentioned, and we'll either come to them at the end, or if appropriate, I will jump in and ask Tim throughout the presentation. So, Tim, I'm gonna hand over to yourself. Um, hope everybody enjoys this presentation, and I'll be back in about 15 to 20 minutes. I'm just going to mute off, hide myself away, and we'll speak again soon. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, Hopefully everyone can see my screen. If you can't, um, Hannah and Martin, let me know. I'm going to assume that you can. So we're going to be talking today about one of my favorite subjects, which is this interaction between the environment, the natural environment and the built environment. So how the things that we build interact with the actual natural world. So we're going to be looking at the ground, we're going to be looking at climate and the things we build on that and how they all play together. Um, so this is something which I've been researching for a decade and a half. Um, and about a year ago, I left the university environment and joined uh, Terra Firma to really help um, with this mission to, to help real people understand the ground and how it impacts on their business, on their lives, on their houses, um, and really with this concept of, of enabling informed decision making. So I'm hoping that by the end of today, uh, we'll have given you a little bit more information um, uh, that you can use in your work and your life as well. So today we're gonna to be looking at um, soil related subsidence, ground movement and the impact of climate change in that space. So let's just start with a couple of numbers. Um, subsidence is the most expensive, the most costly ground hazard in the UK. Um, in one three month period alone, it was about 64 million pounds worth of subsidence claims. Um, you know, it, it is not a small cost to the UK economy. And to be blunt, it's going to get worse over the next decade as the climate shifts towards one which is um, uh, has hotter and drier summers, which are a real cause of subsidence. So this is a problem now and it's going to get worse. If you take one thing away from today, that's a good one. Um, it all starts with soil. And most people probably don't have a great understanding of what soil is, but it's a mixture of organic matter, mineral, broken down rocks, air, water, all mixed up together and a huge amount of life that's going on there. You know, there, in terms of an ecosystem, there's, there's a vast ecosystem in the soil and this all works together uh, to make the soil what it is. Now, when we go out and map soil, it looks kind of a bit like this, where you can imagine you have these polygons or, or shapes on the map colored in, in different colors. And they're a little bit complex and confusing. But when you drape them over top of a, of a landform or a shape of the ground, you can start to see how different soils are found perhaps at the top of hills or down near rivers. Um, and this allows us to map the soils across the UK. Once you get an understanding of the types of soils you're looking for, you can, you can start to spot them. Now, many of you will probably um, have watched, whether it's through your own choice or those of your family members, a uh, show like Gardener's World, where they talk about um, sandy soils or loamy soils or clay soils. Um, in actual fact, many soils are mixtures of all these different uh, particle sizes. Um, and this is uh, this triangle here is what we would call a soil texture diagram. And, and you can imagine um, near the top here, you know, are very clay rich soils or sandy soils down in this bottom corner. And in the middle, it's this mixture of sand, silt and clay all together, which we would describe as a loamy soil. Um, across the UK, there's about 
a thousand different soil types. So there's huge variations in soil. Um, and what we try and do is, is understand that soil and then communicate it in as clear a way as we, as we possibly can. Now, a lot of people have this understanding that soil um, is derived from the underlying geology. And much of the time that is true. There are some cases though, where um, the parent material from the geology has been so um, subsumed into the soil that actually the soil doesn't relate to the bedrock that's underneath it at all. Um, so sometimes geology is a good clue to uh, the, the soil and other times it is not. Another thing I'd like just to show you, this is a building site, literally they're building some houses um, on a field behind my house. And I just wanted to, to show in one field, in one building site, the vast changes that you can see in soil type as you just walk. These are probably 10, 15 meters apart. And we've got freely draining loamy soil, some really heavy clays, some stones and some clay loams, you know, all within a very short distance of each other. So soil is not something that you can say this part of the country is only this type of soil. It does vary even within a field. But what I want to give you today are five questions that you can bear in mind when you're starting to think about ground hazards. Um, the first one is, can the soil shrink as it dries? So some soils can shrink and others can't. And what we're gonna look at is a little experiment that I did, where we're gonna look at three different soil types, one which is a clay loam, one which is a sandy soil, and the third one which is a sandy loam. So these are the three soil types. And what we're gonna do, with the help of um, some of my kids Lego is add water to these different soil types and see how they respond. They're, they're currently dry soil samples. Um, we're gonna add water to them and see what happens. So this one in the middle is the sand and you can see that actually it, it, that when you add water it washes away to that. The sandy loam is what's happening here and nothing's happening. But over on this left hand side is the clay loam and you can see that as that soil um, wets up, as it absorbs the water, it expands. And you can see the brick starting to get those classic subsidence um, uh, breaks within them. So this is in reverse, which is effectively subsidence, um, where you can see the ground settling as those soils dry out. Okay. Um, so this, this is just a, a, a silly way that we can look at the different responses to the same water being poured into the tray of three very different soil types. And these aren't even the most extreme types of soil. Um, right, let's move on. Okay, so how does this relate to an actual house? I think that's probably what most people are concerned about here. Well, if you have like that first soil that we were looking at, the sand washout, if your house is built on sand and you have a, a constant drip or a leaking gutter or a leaking pipe, you can form these cavities, these holes underneath the house and the house can settle into that. That's one thing to look out for. Now, if you have your house that's built on like those two other types of soils, the shrinkable clay soil and, um, and maybe the loam or indeed the sand, you, what you'll find is that it, the part of the house that's on the shrinkable clay soil will start to move down, whereas the rest of the house will probably be a bit more stable. So you get this what's called differential movement or differential settlement. And that can lead to serious issues in terms of cracking in your house subsidence. As we saw earlier with those images from the field behind my house, um, there can be a huge range of soil types within even the mapped units. So this one unit here, this one, the soil polygon, has four or five different soil types within it. And those soils vary as you go down. So soil is complex, but what we try and do is take that map and simplify it. You, you know, you don't need to worry whether it's an Evesham or a Denchworth soil. What you really need to know is, can it shrink? So we interpret that soil map and change it into a map that says, can the soil shrink? Is this likely to cause issues for subsidence? And we can expand that across the whole of the UK and we can see you know, which parts of the UK are, have the most shrinkable soils. Some soils do shrink and others do not. So that was the first question, which was, can these soils shrink and swell? The second question is about the weather. Are the summers typically going to be hot and dry? That's what you need to know. 
because where you have shrinkable soils and hot and dry weather, it actually dries out those soils and you get a problem. So we look at things like the soil moisture deficit or potential soil moisture deficit, which allow us to effectively build these images, these maps of the UK, which say which parts typically in the summer dry uh, the soils down to about two meters depth. So that's, that's the red block here. And what we do is take the answers from the first question, can it shrink? The second question, is it hot and dry? And that gives us the subsidence hazard map that you've got on the right hand side. The third question I want um, you just, just to keep in mind is that if the soil is shrinkable, um, what are the trees like that are in close proximity to the house? Because what trees do is they act a bit like um, weather being even hotter and even drier. Um, so we saw that the sandy soils, they, they don't really shrink, well, they don't shrink at all when they lose water. So the trees have no impact on the likelihood. So this axis here is the likelihood of uh, a clay related subsidence claim. Um, but once you start to come up into the clay loams and the highly shrinkable clay soils, the presence of a tree, which is the green bar, leads to an increase in the rate of subsidence claims per property on these types of soil. So having a tree, um, you know, where, where this, we've got unshrinkable soils really doesn't cause a problem to the property in terms of subsidence. However, on the shrinkable clay soils is something that you really need to bear in mind. Uh, not such a good idea. Effectively, this is what happens. The tree sucks out more moisture from that side of the house. Um, those soils dry out even more than the soils on this side. So you get that differential movement, that differential shrinkage again. Okay, um, so far we have those three questions. Can it shrink? Is it hot? Are there trees nearby? Um, fourth question is about the types of property, the type of property construction, um, which make these types of houses more vulnerable to subsidence. Oopsie. Um, and I'm just going to give you one example here. I'm sure in your work you're aware that different houses have different foundation depths, um, different construction types, some mortars are more or less flexible, more resilient to these types of ground movement. But this is probably the most visible example where you can see how you have an old house. Let's say this house is built 100 years ago. Foundations were really quite narrow, uh, shallow. Um, and maybe for the last 100 years, that house has been kind of going up and down like this um, and, and not having too much problem because the movement has been consistent across the house. However, let's say in the 1990s, you come along and you build a new extension to that property and the building regs say, well, you need a two meter deep foundation because this is a shrinkable clay soil. Then what you have is this part of the house not moving hardly at all and the main part of the house, you know, still going up and down. And again, it's this idea of differential movement. So you come through and you can, um, you know, get cracking on that boundary between the old and new types of property. Uh, parts of the property. So it's, it is, it is we do need to be sensitive about how we design and build properties in and extend these properties in these um, types of soils. Okay, question five is really around uh, this concept of the climate. And we all know, well, I hope we all know now that the climate is changing. We're on this journey towards um, winters, which are warmer, and wetter, um, and summers, which are hotter and drier. So the answer to this question is, well, yeah, almost certainly it is going to change, but how is that going to impact us in terms of the properties that we're building and subsidence and so on? So here's some modeling that I've been working on for the last couple of months. And what we're doing here in building up a soil moisture deficit model. So similar to the math that I showed you on the, the second question, and we're looking at for each month of the year um, through from January through to December, how the soil moisture deficit, so blue is really wet and you know, red is, is really dry, how that's gonna change as we go forward um, through time. So this, this first suite of maps here is looking in the uh, 2020s, so the coming decade, um, and probably the most benign scenario, so the 10th 
percentile. So when we're looking at uh, climate modeling, we do need to look at you know, probabilities and so on. So this is effectively the best case scenario that we're gonna get. And you can see how soil moisture deficit builds up into the summer months and then recedes as the rain comes in um, the autumn and early winter time, wetting up those, uh, yeah, wetting up those soils again. Now let's shoot forward to the, the maps on the right hand side. And here we're looking at the 2080s and the median scenario. So the most likely scenario um, for the 2080s. And you can see just comparing these months between the first set now and the future effectively, you can see how much hotter and drier, how much drier these soils are in the summer months. And do you remember that, that second question, you know, whether we have dry soils, it leads to more shrinkage if the soil is, uh, you know, clay rich. So we're seeing a spread of these, you know, really dry parts of the country, even into parts, you know, up in Scotland or the Northeast um, or, and, and North Wales, you know, which are historically really not these, these wet parts of the country. So that allows us to look at, you know, the areas that are most likely to change. And this is really important because if you're, if you are, you know, building, if you're just taking your recommendations based on historic claims of, you know, whether there have been subsidence claims in this neighborhood in the past or in this postcode, you're going to be missing this, this oncoming train wreck of potential subsidence claims. So you look at the Northeast here, you know, in terms of increase in hazard, it's massive um, because there are shrinkable clay soils there and they just haven't been exposed to these hot, dry summers which are coming yet. So we want to just raise awareness of that. And you know, from the from the climate modeling that we're doing, we can say, you know, with various ranges of probabilities that these properties are more likely to have subsidence issues as we go forward over the next few decades. Um, in terms of how, how quickly that's going to, to happen, um, well, probably most of the change, I would guess, from, from the modeling we've done will happen in the next 20 years that we're going to see uh, this is a, a very simple graph looking at the number of properties which are currently at risk uh, from subsidence. Um, so it's jumping up from about 12% of the UK housing stock to about 19%. And then it will in continue to increase after that. Um, but a lot of the catastrophic change will have already happened. So, you know, it really it is in the next couple of decades that we're going to start to see this increase in claims from these types of properties um, in, in areas which up till now have not been subject to um, these hot and dry weathers. So really what I want to do is, is just give you a couple key takeaways. Um, so you can, you can leave this, this time together with a couple things in your mind. Um, infrastructure and houses love boring weather and they love boring soil. So nothing extreme. If it's you know kind of like it is today, just a bit drizzly, not too hot, that's wonderful because the ha the soils are stable. There's not much movement, but that's not what's coming. <laughs> um, there are problems for houses when there's changes in the weather. There's you know, rapid changes between hot and dry, um, or even when there's changes in the soil um, over short distances, where we're moving from a highly shrinkable to maybe a sandy soil or to a loamy soil. So it's those changes in soil and weather that are problematic for houses and for infrastructure. So just a couple things to think of and look out for when you're looking at, at the risk, you know, whether the, the soils are shrinkable, um, whether they're trees in close proximity, maybe extremely sandy soils. Um, and if your house is built on or near sand, um, you know, keep an eye on the drains, make sure they're running clear. Um, and this issue with, older houses with later extensions, so these different foundation depths. Um, so I just want to leave you with those thoughts, but I think what I'd like to do for the remaining time is, is see if you have any questions based on what we've covered today, um, and I can you know, pick those up and, and, and let you know my, my thoughts on that. That's great. Th thank you, Dr. Tim. Um, really interesting, and, and I think it's really important for all of us to note here, you, you know, when we're talking about property transactions and conveyances, there's obviously um, risks we've been aware of for, for ongoing length of time and risks that we've had to report on. But 
climate change is a, a real thing that we need to be considering and, and obviously it's a challenge because the onus is typically always placed upon the fee earner until the, the lenders or our governing bodies give us clear definition of what, what the expectations are but you know it, it's no longer just about contaminated land and, and flood and things like that. There's very real risks now with both energy infrastructure, things like substances, you know, um, ground movement and, and shrinkage is increasing all the time. Um, it's very real. On Thursday, we'll be having the, the next one of our TMTV uh, sessions based on coastal erosion, which is another very real risk um, in the ground. So climate change isn't just about pollution. Um, it isn't just about emissions from our cars and moving to electric vehicles the ground, the effect on the ground is huge. And um, I think it's really important that, that as we move forward in the next 20 years or so, as these changes to the ground really start to impact, we're, we're fully aware of those. So I think that's really, really insightful presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Tim. Yeah. Um, and as Tim said, if any of you've got any questions, please do post them in the chat and I will ask them. So. We've just actually had one through, the, the first one here. So, hi Tim, you should also mention that removing trees is not the answer, as the soil will be used to the removal of moisture by the tree. Removing the tree will cause the soil to become wetter and it will expand heave, which also causes structural issues. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Whoever said that is bang on and you need to do these things very, very carefully um, because it's exactly right in that, um, you remember that in the image, effectively, you know, when you have a soil which is chronically dried out once that water is there you know then you can have that soil expanding once more so yes absolutely right um is i'm not for a moment suggesting that we go around chopping down trees um uh, i know in some cases uh it, it is necessary to do that where the where the roots are um seriously causing an issue to the house but i certainly wouldn't proactively go out and chop down trees absolutely not thank you for that All right Thank you, thank you, Tim. Uh, got another one just come in here. So is there anything you can do if you do have different foundations on a newer and older part of the house to mitigate the chance of an issue? So obviously referring back to your point where you said the later extension and the differences in um, foundation depths. Um, is there anything we can do to, to mitigate that? Uh, yes, there are. There's some really interesting new technologies coming out, which I'd um, encourage you to look at. Um, some, what's it called? It, it effectively, there, there are these companies who are developing these resins that you can pump into the ground under the older side of the house. So where the shallow foundations are a bit more shallow. So if that's a problem, you might want to consider, I think it's GeoShore, no. Um, anyway, I, I, I cannot, it's, it's some kind of resin based product that you can in, um, inject into the ground, which will stabilize the ground under that part of the property. So again, I wouldn't you know, proactively go out and do this, but if cracks are starting to occur, you can look into those kind of uh, less costly ways of supporting the structure. That's great. Thank you, Doctor. So I've got a, another one here. So uh, naturally one of the, the greatest concerns for our, our fee earners is always going to be around lender requirements and insurability. So, um, I've got a question here. To, to what extent would a typical insurance policy protect against subsidence or subsidence damage? Um, so most insurance policies will cover subsidence unless um, sometimes there are exclusions for if there's been a subsidence case there in the past, um, but most will cover it perhaps with a um, an additional payment, um, like a subsidence, I can't remember what that's called, but yeah, they, they will levy an additional charge for a subsidence um, claim. Okay, I've, I just, I've got a, a couple of them come in here as well. I've just had one um, asking around new developments. So on um, uh, modern new developments, uh, how, how are uh, developers and, and construction uh, building companies mitigating this and avoiding uh, the risk of, or limiting the risk of future subsidence on new developments? Um, this is a pet peeve of mine. I don't think they're doing enough. Um, I, I, I had a, a conversation with a very large, well-known host builder, um, and I was trying to encourage them to look at this issue. And they literally said to me, Tim, we don't actually care 
because once the 10 years is up, it's not our problem. Uh, it becomes the homeowners or the local council's problem. And I was, I was shocked. Not only they thought that, um, but also that they you know, were brave enough to just say that. Um, so I don't think there's enough that's being done in this space. I would like to see um, uh, a, a lot more done in terms of you know, greener foundations, in terms of using less concrete, but also just making sure that the houses are built um, in a way that they will last into the future. So that's, that's my personal view on it. They're not doing enough. Uh, that we need to move away from just pumping concrete into the ground, um, but also just to ensure that you know, the houses do, uh, do last. That's, that's my personal view. Sure, okay. I, I think that possibly answers in part uh, another question. Uh, so they're coming thick and fast. So if remediation is costly and only going to increase in response to wetter winters and drier summers, what do you think, if any, should the government's response be to this risk? Is Build Back better enough? Um, okay, so first of all, if you look at the cost of subsidence claims, I think it's fair to say that over the last 20 years, the cost of the subsidence claim is dropping um, because of the invention of new, new you know, um, newer, cheaper ways of solving the problem. So that's just one point. Um, so, uh, so, but you're right that it will get, you know, in aggregate, because we're going to be seeing more claims, there, you know, it will be a, a larger cost. Um, I would like to see the government, um, you know, push forward with this concept of, you know, carbon neutral or carbon negative housing. Um, and if you just to swing back to my idea, to my comment about the foundation design, that I think it's about 40% of the carbon emissions come from the foundations um, because they're, they're mostly concrete based, which is contributing to this problem of climate change because we're emitting so much CO2 from that. Um, so building back better, yes, um, that's part of it. I think it's, the, the reality is that the vast majority of houses already exist in the, in the UK and we're not gonna go around retrofitting that. Um, so perhaps a little bit more research into the efficacy of these new technologies, like the resins that are being pumped in, or um, you know a, a holistic underpinning um, for these type of properties. Um, but just you know, raise awareness that these these issues are coming in in new parts of the country which historically haven't been exposed to that, and um, almost get homeowners ready for that. Okay, so conscious of time, just uh, one, one final question, um, Dr. Sim, and, and obviously the questions we haven't uh, been able to get to, we will uh, ask Dr. Sim about those after the um, session and share the answers with the attendees. But um, just, just the very last one here. So uh, once a property has been underpinned, how long should it be monitored to make sure there is no further movement for a buyer? How many years after underpinning is it safe to conclude that the problem has been resolved, please? Um, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to probably not answer that because I don't feel I know the right answer. I would guess that it would be something like five to 10 years. Um, you, you know, you, you'd see things stabilizing after that, but that's not really my expertise. So don't hold me to that. That's great. Okay. So, so I, I can handle any other questions while we're online. If, if that, if you're got the time. Uh, okay, I'll just, I'll, I've got one other question here, I think, um, so briefly, can you expand on why most of the change in properties at risk is over the next two decades? Is this where most of the change of SND occurs, or is it 20% the limiting factor for properties on play rich soils? Yeah, it's, it's effectively that if you imagine that the soils um, are currently, let, let's take that northeast example, let's say at the moment, uh, the soils are drying out to maybe 40, 50 centimeters. Um, most foundations in the UK are between 60 and 90 centimeters, something in that ballpark. So we just need to get the soils drying out to that kind of depth. So as we go forward and the climate will get hotter and drier, the soils are just going to dry out even deeper, but it'll already be below foundation depth. So it's, it's more that it's 
it's getting down to below foundation depth and we're starting to see that shrinkage at that point it's not that the climate is is only going to get so bad and then it's going to stop getting worse um but it's just that we're around that that depth of the foundations that's fantastic thank you dr sim i've got one final question then for you which is, is, is perhaps a little bit um uh, subjective and maybe even a touch controversial so i've been up <laughs> Would historic issues with subsidence prevent you yourself from purchasing a property? Yeah, would they prevent me? Yes. Um, I'd probably say yes to that um, for the following reasons. One, um, it would prevent other people from buying it. So if I ever came to sell the house on, um, I don't really want to have that hassle. Um, and two, a lot of the historic ways of remediating subsidence have been like partial underpinning. So if you're just underpinning half the house, um, you're setting yourself up to fail again, where you're getting movement, um, perhaps on one side of the property, which hasn't been underpinned um, as much, particularly, you know, if the soils dry out to slightly deeper depths. So for those two reasons, I probably wouldn't unless it was like the perfect house. And I was going to stay there forever. And I never had any plans to sell it on. But yeah, 95% chance, no, I wouldn't buy it. That's brilliant. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Tim. It's been a really useful and insightful session. I hope everybody's found that valuable and interesting as indeed I have. Um, please remember, we have a, another session on Thursday, those of you that are interested uh, discussing coastal erosion with a panel. Um, we will send out a recording following this uh, session and I look forward to speaking to some of you again on future sessions of TMTV. Thank you very much, Dr. Tim, and thank you all for attending. Okay, guys, thanks so much.